Um, over to Laura Collins, who is uh, on our committee, I'm delighted to say, and is editor of the Yorkshire Evening Post. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time away from the small matter of a football match this evening to celebrate and shine the spotlight on regional journalism. Tonight, I'm joined by a fantastic panel of leading ladies from the industry, just to talk about how regional journalism can thrive and what we've learned from covering COVID, certainly over the last year and a half as well. So what I'll do is I'll do a quick introduction of the panel and then we'll kick off. So we've got Maria Breslin, who became the first woman editor at the Liverpool Echoes History in July last year. Maria started her career on the Reporter Weekly newspaper group in Greater Manchester before moving to the Press Association's Northern Bureau covering Merseyside, Cheshire and North Wales. She then joined Reach, which was then Trinity Mirror, as news editor for the North Wales Daily Post before taking up the same role at the Liverpool Echo and the rest is history. We've also got Lydia Hamilton. She's worked in ITV regional news for seven years. For the last two and a half years, she's been at ITV Border as the programme and digital editor, overseeing the broadcaster's programme and digital coverage, as well as managing a team of journalists. We're also joined by Eliz Mizon, who is a freelance writer focusing on media, culture, politics and society. She writes reports and features for the Bristol Cable and is also the newest member of the Public Benefit Journalism Research Centre. We're joined by Abigail Rabet. At 23, she's Reach's youngest ever editor. She'll be taking up the post of editing Norfolk Live and Suffolk Live, two new websites which are due to launch later this summer, and was formerly audience editor for Cambridgeshire Live, Essex Live, Hertfordshire Live and Bedfordshire Live. And last but by no means least, we're also joined by Kathleen Salmond, who's the breaking news editor with the Scotsman and Edinburgh Evening News. And next month, she will be taking up the role of editor of Scotland on Sunday. So thank you all for joining me. I think what we can say is local news really came into its own over the last year as it's helped people make sense of what's happening on their doorsteps from the global unfolding crisis. So starting with you, Maria, what has the pandemic taught you about the importance of local journalism, certainly over the last year and a half? First of all, I'm going to apologise for the light here. I've been um, thrown down to the basement um, while everyone else watches the football, so if you can't really see me, I'm so sorry, but that's the reason why. Um, I think sort of probably to echo what you said, Laura, I think in sort of difficult times, People turn to trusted brands like the Liverpool Echo and many of the other titles represented here. I think the internet is a very noisy place and social media even noisier. And I think people just needed some help in cutting through that noise. And they wanted relevant information that came from verified sources that was fact checked by qualified journalists and presented in a really easy um, to follow fashion. And so I think what I learned was that regional media still is really relevant. Um, and that's the lesson that I've learned from, from the whole pandemic. People did turn to us in unprecedented numbers. And I was really passionate about making sure that every single message we got, every email we received got a reply because people needed us and they were turning to us. And, and we actually reorganized and restructured so we could actually keep up with that demand. And, it ranged from, you know, people shopping their workplaces because they weren't, you know, following um, social distancing measures to people just wanting to celebrate their local heroes and rainbow pictures. <laughs> so many rainbow pictures, you'll probably remember. And you know, I was just really keen to sort of to sort of help people where I could to to find a home for those pictures and just to let them know that we were there because it really did feel like they were turning to us and. And there's a lot to be learned from that. And there's a lot that I'll take forward, I think. Catherine, was there anything you'd like to add on this in particular as well, using your experiences, not only at the Scotsman, but at Edinburgh Evening News as well? Yeah, I agree with Maria. I think people have needed, have never needed so, so badly a trusted local source. But I think with, with wanting to know the, the bad news about the pandemic they wanted the the sort of light and shade 
some you know uplifting tales as well the human tales behind the bad news um so we were very focused on on that you know balance so it wasn't all doom and gloom definitely felt that that was really important over the last however long it's been long time <laughs> And Abigail, would you say that that echoes what you've been doing as well in particular? Yeah, absolutely. That was what I was just going to say. I think one of the things that I learned in particularly just over the past last year or however long it's been, as you say, is the, the value of being entertaining as well as being informative. I think, you know, people have been in this complete and utter bubble of misery almost. You know, people turned away from the six o'clock news. They didn't want to be encapsulated by all of that misery and the way that they escaped from that the only way that people could escape from that was by reading those lighter things by you know giving those sort of silly reviews or you know just writing about very ordinary things that uh, of the time were just very important and offered that sense of escapism and going forward that's definitely something that I really want to put into the Norfolk and Suffolk brands is just the you know we're all sort of living out this life together and everything we, you know, everything is content in a way. And you do have to definitely find that balance between the light and shade, as you say. And whether that means, you know, reviewing your trip to the supermarket, which was, you know, a totally different experience during the pandemic, you know, then balancing that with the more hard and serious news, it's all relative. And Lydia, would you say that that sentiment was echoed certainly in the broadcast industry as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, sort of across ITV regional news, we saw some really encouraging sort of viewing figures over the course of the pandemic, which obviously um, proves how important people thought their local news programme was to them at a time when, you know, there's a global pandemic, which can seem very sort of out of your control um, and I guess sort of I saw our role as um, sort of informing people as how, how they can control it. A colleague I spoke to recently put it really well when she said you know our sort of part of our role is, is about putting power in people's hands you know um, particularly when it came to the sort of more localised restrictions as well um, you know um, we have quite a, a unique pa patch at ITV border we cover Cumbria in the south of Scotland so there is a border in the middle of it so we had very different restrictions either side of the border even before the sort of more localized tiers and levels came into play as well um, and you know what, what the others have said about light and shade um, <laughs> we came under quite a lot of criticism you know news as a whole not just regional news but news as a whole about you know it being too depressing and everything being about Covid so absolutely those sort of lighter more uplifting stories were you know if not as important as as the kind of you know crisis that we're reporting on as well. And Elise would you say that this was similar as well for your time at the Bristol Cable like did that differ for you or or was your sort of general consensus the same? Um, well, I think I think I'm in quite an interesting position in many ways because um, I started freelancing fairly close to the beginning of the pandemic. So I don't. I think it was maybe no November, just before. So only a few months before um, the pandemic started. So I don't have, um, you know, other than a few things here and there, which I, I used to write reviews, for example, um, for my local theatre uh, website, and I used to, um, you know, write here and there, kind of pitch to online outlets, um, sort of culture and media stories. But I wasn't freelancing as a journalist regularly. Um, so uh, it's, it's really difficult for me to say whether or not it's been different or the same. Um, but certainly, you know, the experience that I had was that um, as a freelancer, um, the, the core staff at the Bristol Cable were so busy, you know, trying to keep everybody updated and trying to stay on top of the numbers, stay on top of the changes, um, that it was really useful for them to have freelancers come in and pitch other stories about the area and keep up to date with, you know, the rest of life that was going on that wasn't specifically COVID related. Um, so I think that was something that I really learned from this year was that 
you know, it feels to me certainly that um, it's not been easy. Uh, freelancing has not been my main source of income uh, over the last year and a half. You may be surprised to hear um, it's, you know, it's not like there's a, a wash of um, money kind of running around um, and it's easy to get work. But certainly as a freelancer, if you know that you can offer something other than what everybody else is doing, you know, that can be really, really massively uh, helpful. And it's interesting, we talk about sort of that lighter side and almost straying away from the, the daily news agenda, but one of the questions that was sent in to us in advance, and I think this plays in quite nicely actually, is, you know, regional titles have played an incredibly important role in holding those in power to account, particularly over the last year. So one of the questions submitted in advance were, you know, what are your top tips for investigations, particularly at a regional level? So I don't know if, if anybody wants to jump in and, and offer their top tips there. I'm happy to jump in um, just with a bit of advice from kind of my reporting days, which would have been just, you know, absorb your editor's knowledge as much as possible. Um, have those discussions, um, take their lead, you know, really make use of your news editors as well. There's a there's an enormous wealth of knowledge there from people that are, you know, very experienced um, and, you know, plan to a T, um, go back and forth on ideas multiple times and, you know, just kind of sit and hash it out. A brainstorming session never hurt anybody is kind of my mantra. I think um, I'll jump in as well and just say that um, I've, I've not done a freedom of information request yet. Um, however, I have been doing a huge bunch of research into how to do them because uh, there are a number of ways that you can get rejected. Um, and so it's if anybody is at any point considering doing some FOIs, um, really, really, really meticulously research how to do them because it's more complicated than it may seem at first. I, I just say, <clears throat> excuse me persistence really um campaigns don't um don't come about easily and people you'll find quite often don't want to answer your questions and i also think to take your audience with you um i'm sort of you know very much against the school of thought that scale is a dirty word you know if a campaign is to be successful you want as many people engage with it as possible and um, one campaign we did during during covid um right at the beginning was was why 3000 Atletico Madrid fans were allowed to travel to Liverpool in in March when their own city was on lockdown and they couldn't actually go to games um, in Spain but yet they're allowed to come to Anfield they're allowed to um, they're allowed to use public transport mingle in the bars etc and we were the first um, first publication to sort of say surely there's a link between this and the spring surge that we had in Liverpool and no one wanted to answer that question and we just had to be persistent um, while at the same time always engaging with our audience to make sure they were still with us and and we asked so many different people I'm not sure we ever got a straight answer but every time we got the opportunity to raise that we did um, you know we we may not have won I'm not sure what victory would have looked like really but but it really is just a case of having a strategy and and just you know being persistent with it I think. With that particular example, Maria, how did it feel for you as the editor of the title, almost, I guess, putting your neck on the line as well by being so vocal about that? Because it must take a lot to feel very empowered to, to do that. And I can imagine that a lot of people would think, where do you get the strength or where do you get that from to be able to do that? Well, I'm sure you know, but um, it's difficult, but I really thought, and this probably goes against all the advice of the Reuters Institute, etc. but I really felt last year was the year that the Echo found its voice again, really, and, and we weren't always objective um, in our coverage, you know, when Liverpool was chosen as the city to, to pilot um, at testing, we, we did come out and say get tested, you know, we did work very, very closely all the way through with the authorities. And the result of that is, is a much better relationship with, with hospital trusts, et cetera, than, than we probably had before the pandemic. But it's a difficult balance, isn't it? In terms of, you know, are we telling our readers what to do? Or are we, you know, but it, on this, on this occasion, we discussed it at length. Um, and obviously we were gonna have detractors, it was inevitable, but, 
that we really felt it was right for the city. We felt we'd done enough research. We'd spoken enough to enough people to think this could make a difference. And we were, were in a very bad place before testing began. So, so we decided quite early on that we would stick our neck, necks out. We would say get tested. We would, we would side with you know the, the, the vaccination program. And there was a lot of anti-vaxxers and um, um, in Liverpool, but we, we just decided to do that because it just felt right. And sometimes you can read as much data as you want, and I think data is incredibly valuable. But if you listen to your audience and you have that feeling it's the right thing to do for the city, then then we did that. And there was this, you know, obviously I can't quantify this, but there was a professor at Liverpool University who said they. She was certain that during the second wave, our coverage had helped save lives. Now, as I say, you can't quantify that, but even if we save one life, then it's something to, to be proud of, I think. Absolutely. Catherine, how do you how did you find that balance that you know Maria talked about in terms of you know serving the, the audience, perhaps maybe breaking away from the narrative and, and being quite vocal, particularly in Scotland? I think. It's always that sort of tricky one when you're covering, like, let's say it's Edinburgh, it's your city and you love it and you have to champion it, but you've also got to hold the, the decision makers and the powers that be to account. So, yeah, I can get where Maria's coming from. You've got to, you've got to, to do what's right. Um, yeah. And Lydia, does that differ from a broadcaster's perspective? in a different way to what it might do sort of a traditional newspaper online organization. Yeah, obviously we're kind of governed by the the Ofcom rules which, you know, um make, make sort of you know campaigns and and things like that a little bit more tricky for us or you know potentially impossible for us. Um so we do have to be, you know, a lot more balanced. Um I would say in terms of, you know, sort of investigations and um, just going back to your earlier question from a sort of TV point of view obviously I can only speak for us um, I definitely um, agree with what Abigail said about you know not being precious about it all being your work um, you know use the team of people that you've got around you because they will all have their own strengths um, and that doesn't make it any less your baby um, but it just means that you kind of make it the best that it can be um, and also just the importance of trust. Um, obviously in television news, case studies are often a very important part of these kind of stories. So make sure that if you are looking to get a case study and, and you're speaking to someone that they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Don't fall into the trap of trying to rush them into something that they might not be 100% sure about. Um, inform them completely as to what it will involve and ensure that trust is there. Um, because what you don't want is for something to come out and them not be happy about it and any future follow-ups kind of disappear. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Lydia. It is all about trust and it's, you know, when you put that, I guess when you put that face to it and you can see it and you understand it, it, it builds on that. How, how important do you think trust is to regional journalism as an industry? And by all means, feel free to jump in on this one. I think we can't underestimate how important trust is and how damaging a lack of trust could be to, to our reputation. Um, I mean, you know, during the pandemic, we were very aware of the fact that um, for a lot of people living in our patch, we were their sort of first source of what the restrictions are and what they can and can't do. And were we to get that wrong, that could have really serious repercussions. Um, so there is a lot of responsibility on your shoulders and there was a lot particularly on our shoulders during such a huge you know global crisis um, so yeah I really don't think you can underestimate it and we see the benefits of the trust that we have with our viewers with you know the kind of stories that people bring to us um, you know that's how you get people picking up the phone and saying yes I want to speak to ITV Border because I know that they'll do my story justice and I know that I can trust them. I think it's really important, Laura, as well, as we're coming out of the pandemic, that that we're seen to be trusted to support our our patches to recover. I know with the evening news, we're running, you know, our campaigns Forever Edinburgh to support businesses to get them back 
um, on their feet. Um, I think that's vital for the for the recovery of you people that we hope can then go and buy our newspapers and subscribe to our websites. That that we are, you know, their voice. I think I'd agree with Catherine wholeheartedly there, and and just to add that sort of trust breeds loyalty, and loyalty results in newspaper sales and and good audience figures and and you know a, a really good chance of a good fighting future. So. It's so important um, and we should never underestimate it, I don't think. I think just developing on what um, you were just saying there, Maria, about loyalty. During the pandemic, we certainly found um, sort of in the southeast that the readers were our eyes and ears. And it is that, you know, they were out and about. They, well, they weren't. They were at home, but they were the ones that were seeing things. You know, if something was happening, if there was a fire, if there was, you know, a big police presence we weren't necessarily that able to be all over everywhere like we were before the pandemic. And they were, you know, almost on the ground and everyone sort of had a bit of their own buy-in to their local paper and to their local website. So we definitely saw, you know, a surge of tip-offs, um, you know, people emailing in, people sending us Facebook messages saying this is going on, or, you know, someone so-and-so was breaking the COVID rules. And it, it almost enabled us to build a rapport with our readers in a way that we never had the opportunity to do before because their buy-in was greater than ever because they were almost involved. So what do we do as an industry to keep that involvement with our readers? Because like you say, Abigail, everyone was so invested and everybody turned to local journalism. But what can we do to, to keep that as we start to, to hopefully emerge on the other side? I think that's a great question and certainly something that we're all thinking about, I think, um, as we sort of come out of the pandemic about how to create, ensure that our brands are sustainable going forward. I think there's an element of being flexible and adapting to how change keeps coming. Um, I think offering potentially something different. Um, we're putting a lot of emphasis on things like newsletters so that people can receive news in different ways. Um, almost looking at the ways that we can tell stories um, differently too. Um, but also doing the thing about giving back. Um, we ran some really great campaigns, um, Back for Good, um, which where we went out um, in June um, and we spoke to local business owners and we live blogged and we did live videos. And that was just, you know, really implementing ourselves back into the community and saying, thanks for being there for us. Now we're going to be there for you and give you that, you know, retweet of your brand advert and do those things just so that everyone could kind of, you know, have that buy-in again. I'd say, Laura, it's vital that we get our reporters out of home working as soon as possible and away from desks and out in the community to to do the job that I'm sure they all signed up for that wasn't sitting in their sitting rooms or wherever they're they're doing this and be back visibly present. I think that's absolutely vital and can't happen soon enough, especially for some reporters who have never worked in an office and have never had that chance to to do the sort of reporting that that anyone who's done it for a long time has loved. Um, and I think that that will, you know, develop the, the quality of what we can get and the breadth of it and touch upon what Maria was saying there, the, the two way stream of the loyalty. You cannot, the home working cannot continue in this desk bound way for too much longer. And with the changes that people have had to make and adapt to new ways of working during this time, Catherine, can you see any of these changes potentially sticking in the way that, you know, journalists work or the hours journalists work or particularly for women? Can you see there being some sort of benefit to this as well? Absolutely. I think home working has for so many people, men and women, but a lot of women, I think, fall into to be in the main, you know, benefiting it from probably on the main, just the the ability to juggle your life around your work in a way that wasn't there before, you know, a bum on a seat, however many hours a day. I think there's a more, certainly in our newsroom, a flexibility and a willingness that it just, it was just that you had to be in this office. So I do think that some sort of model going forward of a bit of office, a bit of home, all around the place, the tech has shown us that it can work. Um, so I think for, for women, I would like to think that that flexibility could be um, quite empowering. Um, I know the job that I'm going on to do in a month's time could never ever have 
dreamed of applying for that job had home working not been um, a possibility. So yeah, I'd like to think that this is a huge positive to come from the pandemic and it's it's quite sad to think that it's taken a pandemic to sort of sugar up how how reporters can work and that you don't have to to be bound to an office. Um, yeah, I think it's really exciting and I hope that other people have had that experience. I think it's limiting when you're you're chained to your house, but I think if if employers can give you the freedom to do bits of both, I think it could be fantastic. And Elise, how would you say that this could this benefit from a freelance perspective as well? Does it make it harder? Does it make it easier? What's your experience? I'd certainly say that it makes it easier. Um, I think in all of my work that I do in you know the various areas, I think that it's made it so much easier. I mean, even just losing a commute has been huge. Um, just in terms of, you know, not only the amount of work that I'm able to do, but just generally in the mental well-being. Um, I, I have to say, you know, I am pretty much an introvert. I'm very happy being by myself at home all day. <laughs> um, and, you know, the the times when I go out and I interview people, for, et cetera, for stories, like that is a really good balance for me. Um, so I can imagine that if people really loved being um, you know, in the office, and that's something that they're missing after a year and a half, you know, there is definitely a, an element of just personal choice to it, for sure. Um, but I have to say that for me, it's really worked. And I and I think that just some of the most kind of poisonous parts of, you know, work life balance, such as people who have really long commutes, I mean, I'm not based in London, but I know a lot of people, you know, who live in London, even if you're living fairly centrally, like the commute was pretty pretty killer so um yeah i i can certainly vouch for it <laughs> as a freelancer and lydia this must have been quite different for a broadcaster's perspective because you know clearly you guys are out there front facing filming your team are, are really at the heart of it what kind of things have you taken from this yeah, it's been it's been really interesting, actually, at, at, at the very start, when we sort of went into full lockdown for the first time, people were scared. Um, and there was a lot of anxiety. Um, meanwhile, obviously, our, our reporters were still and camera operators were still going out and about gathering news. And at times they were met with, you know, quite a bit of hostility from people. Um, you know, why are you out and about, you know, you're spreading the virus and things like that. So we had to be very sort of mindful of where we were going, what we were getting, and was it worth the sort of risk essentially. So from a health and safety point of view, it's been really a really challenging year and, and a really interesting one as well. Um, and yeah, when, when we talk about sort of flexibility, it's weird to think that we ever questioned you know, home working. There was a time when we thought, oh, but you can't do that from home. Well, now we absolutely can, you know, even in the TV world, you know, we have software that allows you to kind of remotely access editing machines from home. Um, we had reporters setting up their own little in-home studios where they could do, you know, down the lines and things like that. So um, what, you know, Catherine was saying about the technology um, is absolutely spot on. It, it's amazing what you can do when you have, when you're forced to. And um, I think, you know, th there's absolutely no reason why we would go back to the way we worked before. We'll absolutely take forward, I hope, the, the positives that have come from this and the flexibility and work-life balance that it's, that it's given to people. And with those changes, particularly in terms of technology, and I'm thinking from sort of a, a placement point of view, uh, one of the questions that came up was, you know, how can somebody break into the industry in this time? So what would you say are your top tips for somebody who's looking to break into the industry, especially while they're really trying to get their names out there at this moment? You want me to go? Go for it, Maria. <laughs> I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities um, at the moment, Reach is not the only um, only regional publisher that that's um, that's announced that it's taking on new people recently. So it does feel like a, a good time to get into the industry. 
Um, we recruited someone at the beginning of June, straight out of course. Um, and the reason we gave him a job was because he'd just been very savvy. He, he, he approached us while he was still studying um, and pitched stories, but really good stories. Sto he thought about it. He wasn't just wildly pitching stories. He was pitching them to the Liverpool Echo. And I'm assuming he pitched them elsewhere, but they were really tailor-made and, you know, they weren't perfect. He was still in college, but but you could see, you know, he had the makings of a good journalist. And and I think that's a great way of, of, of standing out from the crowd is, is know where you want to work or, or you know, the, the many places you may want to work and really tailor whether it's your interview or, or, or the stories you pitch to that publication, make them think, they want to work for you not just for any publication and and it certainly worked for him and you know we're always on the lookout for for good content absolutely so if you can sort of stand out from the crowd by by sort of getting your name in there early then you're in with a good chance i think and and there are jobs at the moment there definitely are have you found it easy to recruit people into those jobs particularly with trainees and junior staff do you think young people still want to work on regional titles yeah, I really think they do. I mean, there's obviously, you know, it, it's it's changed massively um, since I've been um, working at the Liverpool Echo. But, you know, so have our titles changed massively as well. And, and you know, we're no longer offering people a job on, on their local newspaper as important as printers. And, you know, as long as a life, I believe it still has. But there's all sorts of different jobs. You know, you wouldn't have had the the job of a, a newsletter lead, you know, five years ago, but only a month ago, we recruited someone, as Abby said, newsletters are a big part of our strategy going forward. And, and, and so there's new jobs all the time and there'll, there'll be another role next year. So I think the sort of variation within regional newsrooms is, is much greater than it was before. And, you know, the, the, there's the opportunity with people with very many different skill sets. So I'd be disappointed if people didn't want to, because I think they're more vibrant and exciting and relevant places than they have been for an awful long time. It's, it's like we've had a rebirth and, you know, we just need to make it work. So I hope so. I love that analogy about the rebirth of regional journalism. It definitely makes me smile when you put it like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> And Liz, what would you say is probably one of your top tips for helping new talent really stand out and shine at this time? So I think one thing that is really important, and I mean, I, I have, as I said, I've been a writer for a really long time, but it's only in the last kind of year and a half, two years that I've kind of committed myself to um, trying to do more journalism. Um, and as I've been um, pitching and looking for jobs, one thing that I've really noticed is that so many jobs want you to have experience in a newsroom, whether that's digital or you know in person. Um, so one thing I would say is like, know, know what you wanna do. So I'm a media writer, I'm fascinated with the media industry. I studied film uh, twice. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with that area, but I've not turned down, you know, when the cables approached me to write about um, a group of allotment holders who are going to lose their pitches, um, I didn't go, well, no, that's not about the media industry, so I'm not going to do it. So, you know, get get jobs that you think you um, can get, go for jobs you think you can't get, just go and get lots of experience. Because if you've got that newsroom experience or pitching experience, even, it's useful, no matter what. It, that doesn't mean that you can't work towards, you know, if you want to be a sports journalist, obviously carry on, you know, um, um, aiming for that. But the fact that you've got newsroom experience as, you know, let's say a, a newsletter, um, you know, newsletter reporter or an audience reporter or something like that, um, even, you know, things like SEO, like that stuff is really valuable um, in terms of skills. Um, and when you, you know, look at lots of different jobs, you'll see how much that experience is valuable. So uh, I guess I would say, you know, know what you want. And if you don't know what you want, any old job that you can get that is going to give you experience is going to be valuable to you. Well, and Catherine, what, what, what would jump out at a CV to you when you're looking through CVs for, for job applications? What in particular do you look for? What stands out? People who can spell, make sure they can spell, make sure there's no typos. That drives me insane. I think um, you'd like to think, well, I think before the CV came, if you're trying to get in, 
there's absolutely nothing that beats a good story. So never be shy that, I don't know, let's say you live in Edinburgh, or Liverpool, wherever, and you've heard something and you might think, oh no, that's maybe not a good story. If your gut tells you that it is, it probably is. So find out whoever it is who's on the news desk or find them on Twitter, give them the tip off and you have no idea how how much you will stick in their mind as somebody who can gather news because that is what it's all about. Don't, you know, don't ever be shy. Enthusiasm, a good story. Always ask questions. If there's somebody, you know, like if you want a job on, I, I don't know, I'm saying the Liverpool Echo. Sorry, Maria, you're going to, everyone's coming to the Liverpool Echo. Find out who who is Maria. Ask, can you speak to her? You know, be confident. Can I have 10 minutes? Can And get yourself known. Um, but yeah, work experience shifts. Again, a lot of that's been made more um straightforward than perhaps you would have thought with home working you know sometimes that can be juggled around studies in a way that you would have had to be in the office for it's not as great but it can be done but but yeah with your cvs um experience enthusiasm if you can get that across and oh my god just like read it a billion times because if there's an error in it it goes in the bin and i've seen it you know the edinburgh evening post or something like that the edinburgh evening times and it goes so Check and check again. Cardinal sin getting the title's name wrong, isn't it? it? Does have you must have seen it a million times, and it's unbelievable. Absolutely, absolutely. Lydia, what would you say is probably your top tip for somebody really standing out, particularly in broadcast as well? Um, yeah, well, so obviously from from my point of view for sort of ITV regional news, I think. We're quite lucky in that people are still generally very interested in applying for jobs in, in regional television news, um, which for us is a great thing, but perhaps for someone applying isn't the best thing because um, I, I think, you know, for me looking through CVs, I would be looking at, okay, who in amongst these applicants really stands out and could bring something different to our newsroom who could help us reach an audience that perhaps you know we wouldn't reach before or bring in stories that you know do you have some really interesting life experiences that would make you really well placed to deal with a certain issue those kind of things I think are tend to be more now what we're looking for um, because a lot of people apply you know having your traditional sort of journalism skills but it's what do you have beyond that that you can that you can bring really um and yeah in terms of sort of how to get into news i would say just as everybody else has said really put yourself out there um, make contacts with people um put yourself forward for work experience be prepared to do that remotely and think about how you will you know stand out don't be afraid to pick up the phone if you're working remotely on a work experience placement um and yeah if anybody wanted to look at the itp job site you know that's where we list all of our current vacancies and the regional news vacancies go on there as well so just keep an eye out for any opportunity um and just one thing to add as well that i've kind of found really useful in my career is if you have the ability to be flexible whether that's in terms of you know where you're working or the location you know that you're working in that can be really beneficial um, I've travelled a lot throughout my career and that has allowed me to sort of um, climb the ladder quite quickly. So um, that can be a really beneficial thing. Obviously, not everybody is able to do that. But if you can, um, you know, that could help you along the way as well. I know we've touched on this about sort of pitching ideas and pitching story ideas. Um, one of the questions that's been sent into us is, you know, how are we sourcing stories now? So I don't know if anybody wants to jump in to help shed a little bit of light on that. I can jump in on uh, on sourcing stories. I think now, as we've spoken previously about the tech is so wonderful. We've got kind of, um, I know definitely in the southeast, we have things like data miner. Um, you know, we've got all of our different social media accounts that we, we monitor for the sort of breaking news situations. Um, but also we have actively been trying to get people out and about more um, for Norfolk and Suffolk, which are launching soon. Um, we've sort of got rep reporters in starting to write launch content. And one of the things that I've been doing is just sort of like once or twice a week, just getting them out, going to places, taking some free time, go and speak to some people, go and find some stories. And I think that 
the benefit of working from home is now that we have got the opportunity to do that and we are more savvy we do have that sort of almost sense now that we can manage our time as a team better so we can say okay this is our team as a whole you can go out today you can go out later today and kind of manage things better um but I do also think you know obviously all of the same ways of getting stories is kind of sticking around you know we have our agencies and we do make use of that and again reader tip-offs they are invaluable to us and they will be for a very long time I think I think that's great advice there Abigail um and we've had another question as well which is all about you know do we have any advice on how you'd improve confidence as well as somebody who's just got a job with a local newspaper and they're feeling a bit of imposter syndrome already. And I think I probably speak for most of us when I say we probably feel imposter syndrome most of the times when you have to pinch yourself and think, I genuinely can't believe that I am the editor of this title or they have got such a responsibility. So I don't know if anybody wants to jump in about how to improve confidence. Um, I'd love to um, talk, talk about this one. I, I feel like this is something that I have experienced, you know, my whole life and I think that something that is a really good um something that's really good to just remember um Kirsty is that you're a trainee reporter so you've just been hired you're a trainee I mean I you know I anybody on this panel is okay to make a mistake the main thing that's really important is that we then rectify that mistake as soon as we can you know we follow whatever procedures are in place to rectify that mistake if, if you make one and your team you know your editor your your sub editors they're all there to help you with any mistakes that you might make so you know embrace the fact that you're a trainee like this is a really great position to be in to be learning the ropes um, and you're going to make some mistakes and then you're going to learn from those so so um, recognize that imposter syndrome for what it is and embrace the mistakes that you'll make because they'll help you to learn, um, you know, and just in, enjoy the job. And, you know, you've got a job, you've been hired, so they want you to be there. Can I jump in on that, Laura? I would rather have somebody who's conscientious enough to have a bit of imposter syndrome than somebody who is really cocky and overconfident because that, from what my experience has always taught me, that those people can be a bit lazy or a bit haphazard, a bit, you know, um, loose with some of their legal stuff. The ones who are maybe really keen to prove themselves will get their head down and that confidence will naturally develop. That imposter syndrome will go as they prove themselves. The exclusives come, you know, the contacts get built, the better stories develop each week. So, Go easy on yourself and just do the job to the best of your ability and sort of ignore that feeling but yeah absolutely better than being full of yourself whoever that was don't worry you'll be fine i was gonna say i think it's Kirsty. i mean as long as you've got a passion for storytelling um then you can learn everything else but do you know don't make the same mistake again do learn from the people around you but really just enjoy it because it's such a brilliant job and you no day is ever the same and you just get amazing opportunities and meet so many good people, even if it is virtually at the moment, that you really should just enjoy it, I think. And as, as everyone else said, don't be hard on yourself. And well done for getting it because it's yeah. not easy. So good for you. I'll just jump in on that as well. I'm not ashamed to say I was nervous ahead of this panel tonight and I thought, why on earth do they want me on this panel with all these amazing senior journalists? Um, so imposter syndrome is very normal and everybody gets it and um, well if they say they don't I think they're probably lying um, so you know it's totally normal what you're feeling you wouldn't have been you know given that opportunity were you not capable so um, just have confidence in yourself and um, don't be afraid to you know put your ideas forward um, and if you're feeling really really shy just fake it until you make it because Nobody really knows what they're doing. <laughs> I'd just like to jump in on this one as well, if I could. Um, I came into my first job at the Cambridge Union News through non-traditional journalism methods. I was straight out of sixth form. I was absolutely petrified. I think on my first day I showed up about an hour and a half early because I was absolutely bricking it. Um, sometimes using that um, like fear 
can actually become a really really good thing it can like almost motivate you to prove yourself and to you know I moved up the ranks very quickly in my roles and you know I'm, it's a phenomenal achievement and I'm very proud of myself and humbled to be where I am now but I do think that um almost need to prove myself has driven me to that point and I think that that is something that you can almost channel to be really really greatly constructive and again congratulations on your new job because that's that's brilliant and um yeah we certainly need more women championing local journalism that's great and I think you're absolutely right there Abigail it is all about you know people looking at those role models and looking at those champions of local journalism to think well if they can do it then I can definitely do it as well so picking up on that theme of, of positivity what would you say is probably your most proud moment as a local journalist and this is free for anybody to jump in on if I can just jump in there my proudest moment aside from like all of my sort of like jobs getting my senior reporting exams those were all momentous achievements but my proudest moment was actually reporting from Stephen Hawking's funeral I was at the time a very trainee reporter I think I was even a what's on writer and um, I grew up in Cambridge it was very very important to me at the time and I, I volunteered I went to my editor and I said please please can I work it it was a weekend shift I didn't traditionally work those news shifts and I sort of said please 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 let me have the shift and he he was like yeah go, go for it and I, I went out into the crowds and I interviewed people and it was my first taste of I think that sort of digital local journalism um so like I went and spoke to people I did video I did you know Facebook lives and all of that sort of stuff and it was just an amazing day and a great thing to be a part of and there was press there from all over the world and it was right on my doorstep and I think that's an example of where you know local news is so special and that will forever live out in my life as one of my like greatest things that I've ever done um so that was a really proud moment for me so always do volunteer if it's something that you want to do because you know it will stick with you Um, really quickly, I'm, I guess I'm always proud when, when I see someone do really well, someone I've taken on, someone I've, I've sort of managed, someone I've mentored. That that always makes me really proud. It's that sort of emotional connection. But work-wise, I think it's it's probably the most important thing I've ever covered was Hillsborough, and I'm extremely proud of some of the coverage we've done um, at the Liverpool Echo on Hillsborough. I don't think anything. I ever do will be more important than that. And I think you guys absolutely set the bar when it came to the coverage for that. So I think that's something definitely to be rightly proud of, Maria. Oh, that's really kind of you to say, Laura. Anybody else want to jump in? Um, I think something that I, I really enjoyed recently, I mean, I, I think that it was really important for um, local people, for sure, uh, around my area in Bristol. Um, I wrote about the uh, 10th anniversary of the Stokescroft riots uh, recently, um, and it was quite interesting that, you know, 10 years ago, it was a huge issue. 10 years almost to the month, I think it was two months different, um, the council actually reversed uh, the uh, campaign, uh, the Stokes, no Tesco and Stokescroft campaign um, uh, wins. Um, and nobody really was aware of this. Uh, no one was really aware of it. So it was really interesting for me to be able to do an, an anniversary piece um, that also kind of shed some light on some uh, uh, things that the council were doing that people weren't particularly aware of. Um, there wasn't much of a campaign anymore, kind of 10 years later. Um, so that was a really interesting piece to do. And I think it was something that kind of showed me that having lived in the area, you know, I was there at the time, I was literally there at the riots, having lived in the area for 10 years, um, really gave me the ability to write that story in a way that probably, you know, other local journalists may not have been able to. So that was something that I felt was um, maybe kind of wouldn't have happened if I hadn't pitched it um, in my conversation with the editors. I felt like that was something that was um, really important and might have fallen by the wayside, um, you know, if we hadn't managed to get that story together at the last minute. Can I add Sorry. Oh, sorry, Catherine. I was just going to say that this year, um, 
one of the biggest challenges that that we've had in our team is that we have had new recruits coming in who've never stepped foot in a, a, a newsroom and some of them are living like with their parents they're you know they're fresh to it all and I would say that my biggest um pride I don't know I hate that word but I suppose thing I'm proud of in my job is always the team and what we achieve together and so particularly this year to have watched on a screen some of these younger ones develop and the confidence that they've had in what they're pitching some really very mature first person pieces that they're willing to put themselves out one writer um very young very very good talking about struggles with mental ill health would she have had that confidence at the very beginning not sure but as a team she has been nurtured in a in a way that probably wouldn't have happened in journalism a decade ago and I do think um, that's been wonderful to see and very positive for for our industry I think that there have been changes in how we bring people on and how approachable managers are and I think that that's um, something that I'm definitely pleased in our in our newsroom particularly to see. I'm just really conscious about time at the moment so just to start bringing the conversation to a close and I guess picking up on one of the analogies that Maria talked about is you know it really does feel like there's been a rebirth and a resurgence in local journalism so if I can go around each of you individually why should local journalism matter now more than ever and what can we do as almost the custodians of the industry to keep that fire burning. So Maria, I don't know if you want to kick off. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us have got, you know, long and illustrious histories of, of you know, campaigning on the behalf of our cities, of, of like telling the stories of our amazing people. And, and that's something worth fighting for, I think. And, you know, we, it is like, without wanting to repeat myself, it is a noisy space out there. And, and, you know, people do need someone to cut through that noise to, to support them, to tell their stories, to, to you know, fight their causes. And, and I don't think that's changed. I don't think that desire um, has changed. And I think picking up on what Catherine said, you know, earlier, it's going to be important that, that we're robust going forward. We, we all want to see our sort of cities, our regions, people, economy come out of this pandemic in, in the best possible health. And, and I think we've got a really important role in ensuring that happens. Um, I, th I think just for civic engagement, you know, for, for kind of maintaining democracy, local journalism has to survive. Um, and we know about news deserts, you know, this is happening in, in the UK and in America. Um, I don't know as much about other countries because they're my main two countries of uh, study. Um, but certainly, you know, there are areas where um, there is no local newspaper anymore. Um, and that is something that I think is, is, is kind of devastating, not only, you know, in an emotional sense, but like in a world functioning sense. <laughs> we have to have local journalism because, um, you know the the national uh, newspapers cannot they just cannot kind of you know deal with that level of workload it, it's not going to function like that so if we want to have a functional um you know democracy where people are participating in their local um democracies and they understand the you know economy around them and obviously covid has proven um that you know local areas for for health public health you know it's absolutely crucial to have that very specific, very localized information. Um, so I think just in terms of functioning uh, democracy and functioning public health, it's absolutely crucial. And I think it needs, it has to have better funding in order to survive. I think we'll only, um, sorry, no, going forward, that the that local news will thrive if that trust that we spoke about before continues and indeed develops. And that we are seen as you know accurate and of quality that's worth reading that can be from anything from your your exclusives your investigated investigations to your what's on at the cinema the whole thing it has to be accurate it has to be of a certain quality 
and that trust has to be there if people you know think we're cheating them then they'll stop subscribing or they won't even start and they certainly won't be picking up the picking up the print product so the trust has to be there between the reader and the the writers i think there definitely used to be a stigma around local news that it was all cats stuck up trees kind of thing um and reporting on those but now it's just it's so much more than that i think in order for local journalism and regional journalism to survive we've just got to move with the times i think you know we're gonna always try and uphold those real traditional methods of journalism, reporting on the things that will matter forever and have mattered, you know, the local democracy and the, the important breaking news stories, but also trying new things. Um, and also building brands around our journalists as much as brands around ourselves too. Um, that's something that I think is really important that, you know, we maintain those relationships with individual reporters and our readers. Um, people like to see the faces behind uh, the people that are delivering the news. And I think for as long as we can roll with the punches and keep being innovative and imaginative and delivering news in a way that is exciting and different, we're, we're, we're gonna stand the test of time, or well, fingers crossed anyway. And Lydia, the final word goes to you. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, I think as, as, as Abigail says, we, we have to be mindful that, that times are, are changing. Um, and in terms of the future of, of sort of, you know, television news, you know, there are some sort of reassuring noises coming from government about the future of um, public service broadcasting. And obviously regional news is, is a really important part of that. Um, but we kind of have to acknowledge that viewing habits are changing and that has accelerated, you know, over the course of, of the pandemic. And it's kind of how do you ensure a, a generation of TikTokers still sit down at six o'clock to watch their regional news every night? Will they be doing that in the future? And, and that's the kind of challenge we've got ahead. And I think just a, a, a sort of open minded approach and adaptability and as we've come back to time and time again, it's about trust, I think, um, and, you know, being that trusted source of news. And how very fitting that that final word is all about trust. So thank you all so much for your thoughts. I'm sure you'll agree it's been a really fascinating discussion. So Hilly, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for that. It was, it was really interesting. It was, it was very reassuring to actually hear that people still do believe in, in journalism and they do really trust um, local and, and regional sources of news. I think that's so important for us all to hear that at a time when uh, I think a lot of us feel that um, nobody ever believes a, thing, a single word we say and we're, we're, we're competing with all the um, the rubbish that can come out on social media. So thanks for that. And, you know, great to be reminded too of some of the absolutely key stories of our, our lifetimes, really, like Hillsborough, for example, uh, and how important um, Liverpool Echo was in, in covering that story. And really great tips um, and advice from all of you, which um, having having been based in, in London and, and now teaching um, young students it's it the, the advice is the same <laughs> the advice is the same wherever you are um for young people so that's that's good to hear as well so thanks very much to to laura for helping us get together this panel and and chairing it so well and bringing in so many different voices um i'm just going to tell you about uh, a, a few of our events coming up um we're going to be rounding off um our, our, our current season with uh, two fantastic in conversations. Uh, one is with Marianne Seacart, the broadcaster and journalist. She's got a new book out called The Authority Gap, why women are taken less seriously than men and why that matters. And she's going to be talking to Amber Rudd, former Home Secretary about that on July the 6th. And then on July the 14th, we have the brilliant Emma Barnett, Need to Know Introduction, Newsnight, um, Woman's Hour, of course, plus um, a, a book out herself. So do join her. She will be talking to um, Alison Phillips, our, um, our chair, and of course, who, um, as editor of the Daily Mirror, works for Reach. 
so come to that and also um if you're freelance we've got a great the final in our masterclass series with donna ferguson which is all about funnily enough overcoming imposter syndrome and increasing your earning power so learning about um how you can use your skills to do different types of work types of work how to network make contacts and also importantly how to know how much literally your 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 work is worth in terms of money so um we've popped the links in the chat there thanks very much um so just remains to say thanks again to everybody thanks again to tesco do catch up uh, on the video and with the, the the bullet point tips we'll be writing on our website and hope to see you all again at which very soon and do enjoy the football on the catch up <laughs> thanks everyone good night <laughs>